Wildlife expert Jean Duplessis explores new heights as he climbs Africa's highest mountain, Kilimanjaro. Okay, Off we go. Scientists predicted a quick demise for its famed glaciers, but 10 years on, they're still there. There's just been an avalanche up there. Now the question is, for how much longer? Every year is becoming smaller and smaller. To get there, Jean will venture into thin air. There's almost nothing surviving up at these altitudes. At the southern end of the Serengeti lies the ruins of a massive volcano. More than two million years ago, in what must have been a spectacular event, an eruption emptied the volcano's magma chamber, causing a catastrophic collapse of the volcano, forming a massive caldera 20 kilometers across and burying the surrounding area in a thick layer of ash, creating Tanzania's lush Serengeti Plains. 160 kilometers to the west stands another giant. Rising nearly 6,000 meters out of the savanna, Kilimanjaro is the highest peak in Africa and the largest freestanding mountain in the world. Kilimanjaro is a volcano. People who live near its base believed it to be extinct, but signs of activity at its summit crater are proving otherwise. Kilimanjaro is only dormant, quietly biding its time until its next major eruption. Wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis has lived in the shadow of Kilimanjaro for 20 years, but he has never climbed it. That's about to change. Every year, thousands of tourists come to Tanzania to climb Kilimanjaro no doubt drawn to the glaciers at its peak, the famous snows of Kilimanjaro. Over a decade ago, scientists predicted global warming would melt the glaciers, but they're still there. So now, Jean is climbing it with a mission. He's heading to the summit to see for himself how climate change is affecting the glaciers. Once on top, he will also look for evidence that the volcano's magma chamber is active. Jean's guide is Mount Kilimanjaro veteran Edward Seth. He works for a commercial tour company called Nature Discovery Tours Tanzania. I started working with this company as a porter before. Now I am a guide, but started as an assistant guide, and now I am a head guide. He's been working for Nature Discovery for five years, been up the mountain over a hundred times. There are 10 different routes up Kilimanjaro. Jean is taking the Umbwe route, which is considered to be the toughest because of its steep ascent, rapid change in altitude, and physical demands. The ascent will take five days. They will establish five camps along the way, including one at the summit crater at 5,730 meters. And what's happening now is all the porters are getting the, the equipment off the vehicle, setting everything out, and behind me is a scale so every piece of equipment will be weighed, and by that, it will be established how many porters we need to take with us on the mountain. The porters are packing the gear that they'll need over the next week. It's Jean's first altitude climb, and he's surprised at the extent of the expedition for such a small team. At the moment, we stand at 21 porters. Yeah, do we really need all of these people and all of this stuff? It's incredible. Yes. This is obviously much more than just a gentle stroll you know looking at everything that's been taken along for us it seems like it's going to be a far cry from a primitive stay on the mountain there's mess tents and fancy menus we are like proper wageni
Uh, we just started the walk, um, just left Umbwe Gate, and uh, apparently the key to Kilimanjaro is just to take your time to gradually and slowly acclimatize to the altitude change. This is a supported climb. Porters carry all the gear, everything the expedition needs for a week. This frees up the clients to give them the best chance of adapting to altitude and reaching the summit. Because of the sheer volume of equipment and the challenges of the climb, there are porters whose sole job is to support the other porters. The climb will take a total of seven days, five days up, two days back down. There are no really easy days on a climb that moves to altitude this quickly. Today's first hike will see a gain of over 1,200 meters in altitude. Kilimanjaro has five climatic zones, the most found anywhere in the world in one single place. They start from the savanna at its base through rainforest and giant heather. At about 4,000 meters, the system changes again into an alpine desert. And then finally, Arctic conditions at the summit. Jean's first day has been spent trekking through the rainforest that covers the lower slopes. This rainforest gets one to two meters of rain a year. The rainforest has an abundance of wildlife, but the vegetation is so dense that it's hard to see what's there. Just found some Sykes monkeys or blue monkeys up in the trees here. There's also a group of colobus with them. These are typical monkeys that you find in these montane forests, especially in the, these East African volcanoes. They mainly feed off leaves and then berries and things that you get here, but uh, they're generally leaf eaters. Classic to the colobus monkeys, they've only got four fingers to aid them in moving through the trees very quickly, where the Sykes monkeys are more of your typical primates, where they have a hand as humans. Something that's interesting about these colobus monkeys are that they, their babies are completely white, and the theory behind that is that they are quite clumsy because they are missing a thumb. And uh, it's very easy for them to drop the babies. So by being white, they tend to see them much easier. And then of course, when they do drop them, they can see them lying down in a very dark leaf cover. You can see a Sykes monkey through there. They are kind of scuttling away. You can hear some very high pitch, almost bird-like warning calls. To them, we are obviously a predator. I think their real predator in here is more than likely leopards, but their number one predator would be crowned eagles. It doesn't take Jean long to discover why this Umwe route is considered Kilimanjaro's most challenging. We're just about to walk into our first camp, so apparently this was the Toughest day of them all, a very serious climb. Um, it was uh, at least seven hours of hiking and it was pretty steep, I suppose. We are going up Kilimanjaro, aren't we? Some of the porters are already ahead, setting up camp. According to Edward, this is their least favorite route. And I can completely understand that, carrying everything they are carrying. What Jean does not know is today is the longest day and not the hardest. Each day will get progressively harder. After seven hours of hiking, they've arrived at Camp One, their home for the night. Good job. 9,500 feet. Yeah, you're welcome. Good. Yeah. Good. Day one, done and dusted. Covered a lot of ground and uh, up in a beautiful forest camp. Moss and lichen hanging off the trees, mist moved in, and um, it's actually not so cold. It's just really stunning. The, the crew and the porters are setting up camp at the moment. And um, I'm ready for a nice warm cup of chai. The journey transitions from heart pounding. This has been pretty much a straight up climb. To breathtaking. 
This is incredible. Wildlife expert Jean Duplessis is climbing Africa's highest mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro. Rising 6,000 meters above the savanna, Kilimanjaro is Africa's highest mountain. Very serious climb. We are going up Kilimanjaro, aren't we? This is Jean's first time up the mountain. He's led by veteran Kilimanjaro guide Edward Sath, who works for Nature Discovery Tours. According to Edward, this is the Porter's least favorite route. As the sun rises, Jean prepares for the challenging day ahead. Wait about the water. So you do it. This is morning of day two. It's a beautiful morning. The sun is out. There's no clouds. Things are going to be a fantastic hike. The crew here behind me is packing up and they will set off soon. It's a short but very intense day into Barako camp. According to Edward, about four hours, but extremely steep. It's not just a steep climb. Today's route is also the beginning of Jean's biggest challenge, acclimatizing to the altitude. Barranco Camp is at 4,000 meters. The porters have done this many times and can move at a faster pace and will go ahead. Edward will keep Jean moving at a slower pace, so he has time to adjust to the lower oxygen level. The bonus is that Jean will have time to stop and explore the natural beauty of the mountain's diverse landscapes. Today's route will take them out of the rainforest and into the next of Kilimanjaro's five ecosystems, the moorlands. Jean is traveling through the tail end of the rainforest, which offers a lot to investigate. With upwards of two meters of annual rainfall, this rainforest is a dense and biologically diverse landscape. We have some uh, moss and lichen hanging off the trees everywhere around us. This is also commonly referred to as old man's beard. The trees everywhere here are covered with this and it's completely reliant on the mist that comes in here. It captured the uh, water drops and it would hold that and slowly during the day we drip down, providing a constant source of water for these plants during a day. Because of the steep terrain of this route, the surroundings change quickly. The thick rainforest canopy begins to thin out, allowing more light to penetrate the floor. As they transition into the moorland, giant heather rises above the thick carpets of moss that covers the ground. The moss is a perfect habitat for some of the mountain's smaller creatures. So I just came across this chameleon. It seems to me like a young, flappet necked chameleon. And um, what's interesting is that it's very dark, much darker than chameleons you would find at lower altitudes. And that's clearly to absorb maximum heat in these colder climates. Um, of course, another reason might be that it uh, is displaying warning coloring because I picked it up. It's fluctuating between black and yellow and the yellow is clearly to aid in camouflage because it's living on this heather and uh, that will help him to blend in much easier. There we go. The majority of climbing routes on Kilimanjaro rise gradually through the rainforest, which lets climbers ease into the higher altitudes. But the tough Ombwe route is relentless. It has no undulation to give relief to climbers, but continues straight up. They said yesterday was the hardest day.
This has been pretty much a straight up climb from camp this morning and according to our guides, it's pretty much like this all the way into our campsite. So far, the thick rainforest canopy has blocked the view of the summit. But as the group climbs, the heather stops abruptly. And Jean gets his first glimpse of Mount Kilimanjaro. They are now out of the rainforest and are entering Kilimanjaro's third ecosystem, the moorlands. Jean, who knows the Serengeti and all its wildlife well, is seeing this landscape for the first time. We just walked out of the forest and suddenly start to go into this moorland zone and immediately walked into this giant groundsel forest. It's incredible. It's my first time to see these plants. It's like walking into the kind of alien world this is a, a type of tree that one finds on most of these large African volcanoes. Um, similar mountains like Mount Kenya, the Ruanzoris, Mount Meru, all at this altitude will find this tree. These groundsels are extremely well adapted for these cold climates. You can see they've got furry stems, um, obviously insulating them a bit, but the best insulation is down here. These groundsels have all of these dead leaves to insulate the inner tree, protecting it against these extreme cold weather. Also on these moorland zones, you find a large variety of specifically adapted flowers and grasses. There's a lot of these alpine grasses and these flowers are hard and papery to make them survive these extreme windy and cold conditions that's very frequent on these slopes. They have been climbing for just over four hours and are now at the Barranco Valley. This is where they will make camp tonight. From here, they will have a clear view of the main peak of Kilimanjaro. We're just about to walk into our camp for tonight. This last stretch has been really nice and easy. And um, it's a beautiful day, sunny, about five, six hours on the trail, and a really much different environment. Kilimanjaro's glaciers send out a warning. Initially, I thought it was thunder, but then the bottom piece of that glacier just came gushing down. People come from all over the world to see the snows of Kilimanjaro at the top of Africa's tallest peak. A decade ago, scientists predicted that the glaciers would be gone by now because of climate change. But Kilimanjaro's famed glaciers are still there. Wildlife expert Jean Duplessis and nature discovery guide Edward Sapp are climbing to Kilimanjaro's summit. This has been pretty much a straight up climb. A five day trek that will take them to see just how far the glaciers have retreated over the past decade. It's day two of this week long trek and they have just arrived at their camp in the Barranco Valley at 4,000 meters, where they finally have a clear view of Kilimanjaro's peak. Just arrived into the camp for today, Barranco camp. Incredible views up into Arrow Glacier. You can easily spot our trail of tomorrow. Going up here, a bit of a, seems like it's gonna be a bit of a scramble for the first two hours. There's just been an avalanche up there. 
all of the white we see up here is pretty much ice and glaciers. So this is the hottest time of the day and these glaciers start to melt and there's a lot of buildup of water in it. And um, it must have been just a sudden break of that. The ice is melting and um, a lot of water keeps on gushing down and it must have just broken down the bottom piece of that glacier and it just came gushing down a valley there. Initially I thought it was thunder, but then there was just this kind of dust of ice. It's not clear whether this glacial burst is a sign of their retreat. Jean hopes he'll get a clearer picture when he reaches the summit. As the climb progresses, Jean realizes why they need so many porters. Everything down to the kitchen needs to be carried up the mountain. Hello, we are in a kitchen. Uh, just preparing uh, the dinner here. So uh, what we use to prepare is we use the gas tank to cook uh, dinner. As you know that within the national park nowadays, like Kilimanjaro, we are not allowed to use a uh, cook, I mean, uh, to cook by using firewood. So uh, the cook here uh, preparing the dinner, uh, as you see there. So uh, they are preparing uh, uh, beef, uh, beef, steer beef steer fried, and then uh, pe peanut stew, peanut stew. and then, uh, sauce, yeah. yeah, it's peanut sauce, yeah. Yes, and then uh, there you can see uh, uh, soup. Uh, spinach soup, yeah, spinach soup, and uh, a rice stew. So it's really very, very delicious food that yeah, you enjoy. Well, uh, I get a, I, I had a very good night. I slept well, and then uh, John is doing fine too, and uh, he's very strong today. And then uh, I hope you are going to make to the summit, and, uh, but I can't promise uh, about the altitude, but I hope you will be fine. It's morning of day three, and the crew is starting to pack up camp. It's heating up very quickly. It was freezing cold this morning. Uh, today's walk, starts with a really intense climb up the Barranco wall. It's about two hours and as I'm looking out into the distance I can see this trail of climbers going up. So we'll be coming in behind most of the porters of some of the other camps. The Umbwe route is particularly challenging for the porters. Scattered throughout the climb are technical sections that make carrying loads difficult. Today's challenge is the Barranco wall a steep, nearly vertical section up the side of one of Kilimanjaro's lava flows. At Barranco, the Umbwe route merges with one of the more commercial climbing routes. There's a bit of a traffic jam here. No idea how these guys get these loads up through these tiny little valleys and cracks. It's quite humbling. There's one way to do it is with a bit of music. The climbers have to scramble across narrow ledges and up steep crags. The porters have to do this while carrying their packs of equipment. Each hand and foot placement requires precision. There is no room for error. A miss will send climbers down a sheer drop into the Barranco Valley. I think safety will improve, but it's a nice climb. This is Jean's first Kilimanjaro climb, and he's doing well. We are about three quarters of the way up the Barranco wall at uh, 13,200 feet. Amazing climb this morning, coming almost straight up this wall. Certainly some of the steepest parts of this route so far had to use hands and feet. Um, not quite technical, but close to. Behind me, incredible valley, this Barranco Valley, 
which is a glacier valley. About 100 years ago, this must have been filled with ice, about 100 feet deep, where today the ice only starts still a little bit higher. At one time, the edges of the glaciers were below 4,500 meters. Now, it's not clear whether the retreat of the glaciers is a natural phenomenon or whether it's caused by human activity and climate change. Today's climb is not about gaining elevation. It's about acclimatizing to the altitude. At Kilimanjaro's summit, the human body has only 50% of the oxygen it has at sea level, so it has to work twice as hard. As it adapts to the thin air, the body starts producing more white blood cells, increasing the amount of oxygen in the blood supply. Now they are heading into the Karanga Valley, where they face their next challenge before heading into Camp 3. This is the Karanga Valley, and this is our last obstacle before we get into Karanga Camp. It's a very steep climb up into camp, but then it's the end of the day where we can kind of start the acclimatization process because tomorrow night is at the same altitude again to get ready before we go on to Crater Camp. As an experienced walking guide, it's a point of pride for Jean to stay within striking distance of the porters. But in spite of his best efforts today, the challenges of being at altitude are slowing him down. The porters have already set up camp. It is very high and I've never been that high. Jean begins to feel the effects of altitude. I'm really sitting here just contemplating my doom for tomorrow. Wildlife expert Jean Duplessis has lived in the shadow of Mount Kilimanjaro for more than 20 years and is climbing it for the first time. Along with nature discovery guide Edward Seth, Jean wants to look at the effects that climate change is having on the mountain's famous glaciers. It's day four of this challenging hike. Jean is at an altitude of 4,500 meters. He is within 24 hours of the summit. Now, with each gain in elevation, the risk of altitude sickness increases. The physical demands on the mountain are challenging enough so that most climbers hire an experienced guide and professional porters to do the heavy lifting. Edward is an amazing young guy doing these climbs back to back, you know, doing an eight-day eight climb, come back, repack, go up again. You must be a very strong, stable human being to go up and always take fairly large groups of guests onto um, high mountains and extreme weather conditions where everyone is going to feel bad. Um, so besides being a very fit and able uh, person to do it, you know, he also is your psychologist up there and he's your friend and uh, he's your motivator, you know, and he, it's wonderful to see how these Tanzanian mountain guides can be all of that and almost put their own needs aside um, and channel all of their energy into their guests and making sure that they have not only reached the summit but they have a great time doing that. And, and Edward is a prime example of one of these guides just with all of those qualities. Porters carry loads of supplies up the mountain, set up the camps and cook the meals. A demanding job in an incredibly tough environment. Okay. So uh, we are going to take it and then uh, measure it. Yeah. 20 on the dot. Yeah. So yeah, 20 kilograms. It's an incredible load to lug up Kilimanjaro. You know, besides the going up and down in the, the physical terrain, you are also operating at a really high altitude. For me, it's hard simply just walking up these hills. I can't imagine what it's like for the porters to be carrying 20 kilograms 
on their heads and on their necks, including their personal gear as well. So uh, just in order for me to understand a little bit better, I'm going to try and carry this for a while. So let's give it a shot. Twende. Okay, you ready? Okay, off we go. Each porter will do between one and three trips a month. Working as a porter is the first step to becoming a mountain guide like Edward. After a couple of hundred meters at altitude, Jean is in some difficulty. Now that was no joke. It's uh, extremely hard carrying something like that. First of all, in an uncomfortable position, either on your head or on your neck, going up this hill with no oxygen. One needs to be hugely respectful to these porters carrying these massive loads up here. Most of the guides that guide on the mountain all started as porters. And this seems to be like that little initiation that anyone that wants to go somewhere on the mountain needs to go through. Zaina, 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 Mtoto wa mama, Zaina, Anapenda kitu, Zaina, Eh, 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 Zaina, Yo, yo, Zaina, Zaina, Wageni, Wageni, Wanapenda nguvu, Zaina, Yakupanda huku, Zaina, Oh, 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 Zaina, Oh, 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 Zaina, Zaina. This is where an experienced guide is essential. This is Jean's first climb, his first time at this altitude, and Edward is keeping a close eye on him, watching for any signs of altitude sickness. Altitude sickness is a serious condition that can affect climbers regardless of their fitness level. It can cause fluid to build in the climber's lungs or swelling in the brain. Both conditions can be fatal. Early signs range from nausea to mental confusion. If Jean starts to show any of these warning signs, his climb will be over. The only cure is a rapid descent to a lower altitude. Just arriving in our final camp before the summit attempt tomorrow morning. This camp is sitting at 15,200 feet and I'm clearly a little bit out of breath. It was a steep climb into camp. Um, there's not much in terms of vegetation around here. I don't think anything grows. Uh, so um, we'll spend the afternoon here just to acclimatize and get ready for tomorrow. It's at this altitude that the experience of the outfitting company is important. One of the porters has been carrying a pack that has a state-of-the-art emergency medical kit. So we have an hyperbaric chamber here. Mm -hmm. It works the same as the oxygen, you know. You can use this oxygen or hyperbaric chamber. No. Why? In case uh, someone is suffering with a uh, high altitude sickness, like uh, pulmonary edema or cerebral edema. Do you carry them in this? Yeah, okay. we carry them. We are at 15,200 feet right now, and tomorrow morning we'll be going up to just under 20,000 feet. That's an incredible climb. and. I mean, it's a huge misconception that Kilimanjaro is not a dangerous mountain. It's massively dangerous, and the dangerous day is tomorrow. Altitude sickness can hit you irrelevant of how fit you are. It can hit anyone irrespective, and um, I've got no idea how I will react at those high altitudes tomorrow, so just as well we have this bag with us. At 5,000 meters, we are now in Kilimanjaro's alpine zone. It's a stark contrast to the verdant rainforest that started out the track. Even in this barren wasteland that is difficult for humans, there is wildlife. But by far the most common bird species found in these high altitude camps are these white naped ravens. They, they are all over the place and um, it's not common to find these ravens in huge congregations. Generally, one would find them just in a breeding pair and they would live in that monogamous breeding pair throughout the breeding season. These straight cliffs and harsh environments 
is an ideal place for these ravens to nest. And one would generally find that a pair would look for a ledge. And there they will find some sticks and um, grass and fur and things and make a, a soft bed inside where they will lay their eggs. Pretty much the main reason these ravens are in these campsites are because that they are scavengers. And besides um, eating small lizards and mice and they will even scavenge off dead carcasses. Uh, the main food source in these stark environments must certainly be leftover food from these hikers. They are now within a day's walk of the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro. As well, Jean is hoping to take a detour and hike to the volcanic crater to look for fumaroles. Fumaroles are heat and volcanic gas outlets in the ground that indicate the mountain still contains an active magma chamber just below the summit. Jean's ascent has been rapid, just four days, and so the effects of the altitude are really pronounced. Now the climb becomes a mental game. Jean knows that tomorrow each step will be a gain in altitude and the climb will get harder. It is very high, and I've never been that high. Okay. <clears throat> He's been handling it well so far, but that's no prediction that he will continue to handle the thin air well. Let's, Let's check uh, oxygen saturation and the heart rate, okay? Yeah. Uh, oxygen is 80, 80, heart rate is 83. Yeah, that's really good. 79. 80, back to 80, okay, 80 is good. The cold is another physical stress for Jean. As a South African, he is not used to frigid temperatures as low as minus 20. We'll uh, head out of camp around six o'clock and incredible sunset we just had, kind of going down behind Kilimanjaro with this mist coming and going. Just really, really scenic. We. Uh, we thought for most of the day that we're not going to see the mountain. It was very misty since about 11 o'clock this morning. Um, but yeah, stunning. And I'm really sitting here just contemplating my doom for tomorrow. We would be at least halfway, but apparently we're only a quarter of the way, so... Mount Kilimanjaro is almost 6,000 meters. It's Africa's highest peak. Wildlife expert and safari guide, Jean Duplessis has nearly completed his first climb. He's come to see for himself how global warming is affecting the famous glaciers at the top of Kilimanjaro. And he's hoping to make an extra trip to the volcanic crater to look for evidence that proves that Kilimanjaro has an active magma chamber. Jean is climbing with veteran guide, Edward Seth. In this thin air, Seth is watching carefully to make sure that Jean is not suffering from the beginnings of altitude sickness, which can be fatal. So everyone's up. It's uh, very cold and um, the sun is just about to rise. And we're gonna start this track now. We expect about three to four hours up to the summit. It's beautiful up there. I can already see the sun catching the summit there. Yeah, it's going to be a great day. Can't wait. Day five of the climb, and the conditions are beautiful. Cold, but clear. There's a lot to accomplish on the summit, so they push a steady pace. The plan has been to make a detour at this point to the summit crater to search for volcanic fumaroles. That round trip will add four hours to their day, so they need to keep moving.
So this whole morning we've been walking on an ancient lava flow. It's interesting walking up this mountain where you can see how these different lava flows over the centuries build this enormous volcano. And it's always is staggering to me that this was really at some point down at ground level. And over the millennia, with these various eruptions and these millions of tons of lava that build the strata volcano to be the size what Kilimanjaro is now. be at least halfway but apparently we're only a quarter of the way so I so going at a steady pace feeling good yeah after four hours of climbing Jean is approaching the crater rim it's not the summit but it ends the toughest part of the climb from here the summit is just 45 minutes away if they are going to make their trip to the volcanic crater this is where they'll make that trip Arrival up at Stella Point um, was, was quite epic. It's a very steep hike that last day, and Stella Point is the first time as you come up the side of Kilimanjaro and you kind of reach the rim and you are now looking into the crater. And uh, it, it's a hard hike, especially at those altitudes. We had fairly good weather all the way up and we never really saw snow or ice up until uh, about an hour before we reached Stella Point and, and I thought that was just beautiful to see these ice layers coming down. Looking into the crater with those glaciers there, it, it was a, a really nice, beautiful sight. The top of Kilimanjaro is not a traditional mountain peak. It's actually a broad crater, several kilometers across, with a large inner crater at its center. For a long time, the conventional wisdom was that Kilimanjaro was extinct. But recent explorations have revealed that Kilimanjaro has active fumaroles near the summit crater. The pair had planned to take a detour to Kilimanjaro's volcanic crater to see whether there is evidence of activity. But this far above sea level, the human body has to work twice as hard to do most normal things. And Jean has realized his limitations. He doesn't think he can make the four-hour round trip to the crater and make the summit. After almost a week of climbing the mountain, Jean has to make a choice. When I reached Stella Point, there was a decision to be made, and I decided to rather wait and conserve my energy for the, for the summit attempt. Jean will stay with the assistant guide, while Edward, who is much better acclimatized, will explore the crater on his own. Up until now, they've had fantastic weather. But within a half an hour, a blinding ice storm moves in, and Edward gets caught in the middle of it. Storms on Kilimanjaro can end as quickly as they start, so Edward continues on to the crater. It's a very, very bad storm that we, we are not able to see down to this uh, rim. So, but we are on the top of the rim now. But as you see, the, the weather is really, really amazing, very bad. Due to this uh, really bad weather storm, uh, we have to go back to Stella Point to see John there. Yeah, it's kind of good that uh, in the end I didn't go to the crater because uh, Poor Edward was caught in a massive ice storm up there and he couldn't see more than a few feet in front of him. So, uh, so he didn't get to see much of the crater either. It also shows you the extreme climate of this mountain. I mean, being the highest freestanding mountain in the world, it's so exposed to the elements and uh, there's no mountain ranges on the side of it that blocks the wind all the way from the Indian Ocean. You have got these winds battering this mountain and it, it changed literally in minutes. 
and, 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 and it's such pockets of intense weather where I could sit I mean, almost less than a kilometer away from them and they could be in the worst possible weather conditions and I was fairly sheltered. After almost a week climbing the mountain, Jean sees the snows of Kilimanjaro. Here we go. Last few steps to the roof of Africa. It's day five on Mount Kilimanjaro, and head mountain guide Edward Seth has abandoned his effort to explore the volcano summit crater after a freak ice storm blew in. He is now back with Jean, and the weather has cleared. The small group will investigate Kilimanjaro's glaciers before pushing on to the summit. on the rim now, making my way round to Uhuru Peak. And here behind me is part of the famous snows of Kilimanjaro. These are the, the glaciers that um, unfortunately every year is becoming smaller and smaller. Even Edu here is saying last year the snow and the ice extended way lower down the slopes of Kilimanjaro. And now, today, when we walked up, only just as we were reaching Stella Point, that we start to walk in between ice. Today, they are more than 500 meters away and getting noticeably further away each year. With the reduced snowpack, the glacier will shrink at an even greater rate. Inside the crater, the glaciers have almost entirely disappeared. In 10 to 20 years, they will be completely gone. Although scientists who predicted their demise were off by 10 to 20 years, it is evident that the famed snows of Kilimanjaro's days are numbered. Jean and Edward push on towards the summit. Last few steps to the roof of Africa. After just five days of climbing, Jean stands on top of Kilimanjaro. You are now at the Uhuru Peak. Looking down from the peak of Kilimanjaro gives them a greater understanding of what the Serengeti must have looked like two million years ago. The plains were built on the ashes of Ngorongoro after a massive eruption that destroyed it, but created the landscape that has nurtured life for two million years. And it is possible that one day, Kilimanjaro will roar to life again in a major eruption that will destroy itself, creating a new crater like Ngorongoro and building a rich new ecosystem. Kilimanjaro for me was a, a really nice experience after living in Tanzania for so many years, doing it for the first time. It was scenically just so incredibly beautiful going up through those forests and uh, to see how the vegetation changed through the altitude and uh, being next to those glaciers and uh, just seeing how magnificent they are. Um, it was, was a really nice, nice thing for me to do, certainly. Zaina, 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 Mtoto wa mama, Zaina, Anapenda kitu, Zaina, Eh, 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 Zaina, Yo, 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 Zaina, 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 Wageni, Wageni, Zaina, Wanapenda nguvu, Zaina, Yakupanda huku, Zaina, Oh, 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 Zaina, Oh, 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 Zaina, 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 Mtoto wa mama, Zaina, Anapenda kitu.